Oh, hello, everybody kind of group up here, so we have a good, good chorus uh, as we sing. Um, just talk to my dad. He loves that song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, his favorite song. So um, as you all, as we lead today and as we join in song, think about the words. Um, our first song is Your Grace is Enough, and it is. And his mercies are new every day and every moment. So um, as you sing and as you reflect, um, would you um, just join us in that? Would you stand?
We invite you to stand again <laughs> for worship, <clears throat> and this is a reading from Psalm 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you were brought forth the whole world from ever to everlasting, you are God. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. you have blessed us immensely in so many ways but most of all with eternal life through your son Jesus Christ and we thank you for that this morning we thank you for the many blessings that you've poured out upon us 
And we pray this morning that you would equip us to do something with those blessings for your kingdom and for your honor and for your glory. And so this morning, as we give our tithes and offerings, we ask that you bless them for the work of your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, the Apostle Paul writes to the church, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Would you stand and join us as we lift our hands You 
We do serve a faithful God. Justin, did you want to make a quick announcement before we get going? Please do. Here, I'll borrow, I'll borrow this to you. I feel very privileged. <laughs> um, so just a quick announcement that I wanted to make. Um, we are still actively recruiting for some of our worship team, uh, the tech side of our worship team, because they're every much uh, as bit a part of it as the musicians on stage. And so we are in, in, I would say, pretty great need of people who would just be willing to learn how to run the slides for the projector. Uh, we're very fortunate that Gerald has jumped on board with the sound and the videoing. Um, but sometimes, you know, if we have to move clay over to sound, uh, we do need that spot covered as well. So if you'd be interested, if you'll just come and see me or shoot me an email, and I'd be glad to get in touch, or you can also get in touch with Clay, and we'll get you plugged in on the projector. Thank you, sir. Absolutely. And also, something very, very important in your bulletin, you will find this Jaipal home blessing. We have a privilege, we have an honor to go to the new home of the Jaipal family this afternoon at 5 o'clock. The information's in your bulletin. It's at 180 Crestmore. It's out old 421. And we're going to add, ask God's blessing on their home. And, and I think it's absolutely astounding that we would, as a church family, be incorporated into the blessing of their home. Thank, we thank the Lord that she was able to find something that she wanted for you and your family. And we were able to see that process, how God answered prayers. If God answers prayer, should we not be grateful and should we not be thanking Him? Absolutely. So I would encourage you this afternoon at 5 o'clock, 180 Crestmore Drive, to be for this. That's fantastic. It's beautiful. This is beautiful. Well, good morning, everyone. I appreciate very much you being here. A lot of things going on this week, isn't there? Just a lot of things in the news. And uh, I had somebody talking to me this morning about uh, some of the Supreme court decisions that were being made, some landmark decisions. And, and you know, some people, and, I, and you know me, I'm not going to get too political about it. I definitely have my beliefs. Like say, for instance, Roe v. Wade, I believe it's wrong. I believe that God, at the point of inception, God is the only one that can create life. He, he breathes life into the living. Read in Genesis. He breathes life into the living. And so I believe at that point that life occurs. And so I praise that 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 decision uh, through the con now now what they will do get ready they will go ahead and they will change the law and so just be looking forward to that battle as well but it said you know when they defeated that and they said no longer is abortion the, the, the law of the land the right of the in the land it said but but people are more for it than there are against it in, in this country people would vote to go ahead and have it as opposed to not have it and I'm going to tell you the honest truth that it does, right, you know, majority doesn't always make the right. Now, we are a constitutional representative republic, and we elect people to make decisions for us to do the, the, the to make decisions and to do the things of the, the government that we require for them to do. And so I'm just going to tell you this morning that I'm going to be praying for strong women and men of God to be able to stand in the gap and to be able to protect unborn children. I'm, I'm just going to be honest with you that. But if we were a true democracy, if we were a true democracy, and everybody had a vote, and we didn't use the type of representative, republic, uh, representative government that we had, we, there would be a lot of things, folks, that you and I, being more traditionalists, I'll say, and for certain for me, Christ follower, we would be in the minority. And if we were in the minority, we would be overwhelmed by a majority vote in this country that would take us in an absolutely wrong direction. Sometimes what is right is not popular. Okay? And me taking this stance, maybe to some people, is not popular. I have what I believe is rightly dividing the Word of God on my side. And if, if I'm wrong, God will let me know. Okay, that's my stand this morning. By, no, well, no, that's not, that's not, that's certainly not what I'm looking for. But I appreciate the fact that we need to be strong in Christ because in your life, you have been around it before, the popular thing is not always the right thing. Pray with me. Father, as we open up your word this morning and as we start to, to read the, the, the book that was written by Jesus' half brother James. What an astounding 
opportunity this is, Father, for introspection. What an astounding opportunity this is to see your word in action. How, Father, we're, we're, as we read this book, I pray, Father, that we all just open our hearts, our eyes, our ears, that we can see you clearly. This is your word. This is the word of God. You breathed plenarily verbally. You breathe, breathe these words to the writers of Scripture so that we might be able to receive them. And we might be able to read them, understand them, interpret them, and act on them. They're not just a good idea, Father. They are mandates from you, the creator, sustainer of all life. And we are here to humble ourselves before you this morning through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We're going to be in the book of James, towards the back of your New Testament scriptures. What a, what a wonderful book. And, and like I was saying, this is the half-brother of Jesus. This is, if, as they name them, James comes, and I think Jonas or something like that, and Judah. I don't, I don't remember what all the names are of the siblings that they call out in, uh, in Scripture in different places of Jesus' uh, half-siblings. Half but Jesus, of course, being the eldest. And then you have these youngers. And so uh, he's, James, when I think about James... And I think about his life, what it must have been like to be raised with Jesus, the Son of God. And because he's his half-brother, many people, especially in the Eastern churches, say, James, the brother of God. We we kind of wince at that one a little bit, don't we? (laughs) We do. But truly, he was, and he he grew up with Jesus. Now, Jesus probably was a pretty good kid. I'm going to say, Jesus was probably a pretty good student. Jesus probably didn't look for things negative to do. He probably looked for the positive things to do. He was probably there to give a kind word. He was the son of a carpenter or a construction guy. He was probably no wimp. Jesus was working from the time he was very young and probably would have been like everybody else back then, pretty tight to the bone. Don't you know that when Jesus was, everybody's been bullied at one time of their life, or they've been a bully also. When Jesus was around maybe somebody who bullied him, what would James do? Jesus, come on, dude, stand up for the family. You know, what? maybe, maybe he was embarrassed. Maybe he, I don't, I don't know. Just, I'm, what I'm trying to do here is paint a picture for you about a younger brother of Jesus and what he must have gone through. And then, as Jesus went into his ministry, and Jesus traveled about, and Jesus, they went looking for him. They said, he's lost his mind. And so his mother and his siblings, his brothers, they went looking for him, saying, Jesus, come home. They're, and they were telling him, Jesus, outside is your, your mother and your, your brothers. And he goes, who's my mother? Who's my brother? We've read that. So it must have been very, very difficult for James to look at his older brother and to know him, be raised with him, and love him, and respect him, and know that his mind is, is not like ours. His, his beliefs is, are stronger than mine. I don't understand how he can stand so firm in the eye of adversity. I don't know how he can be so strong whenever, whenever it looks like weakness. And he's just, I can't even imagine what James is going through. Okay? You get me? And then Jesus goes to the cross. And Jesus is crucified, dead, buried, resurrected. And James sees that. And he's no longer having to console his mother because she knows she's been to the tomb. He's no longer there. And as they are waiting, and Jesus has appeared to them, and, and it talks about in 1 Corinthians 5 how, how he sees them. He, 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 they're waiting for, in Acts, they're waiting for them in the upper room. It talks about Mary being up there. It talks about others being the brothers up there. And they're waiting, and then Jesus appears. And so James is just like, I'm, I can't even imagine. He's going, this, look guys, I was raised with him. You walked with him for a couple of years, or you might have met him and heard him preach a couple of times, but I was raised with this guy, and I knew there was something different. And I knew the stories in my family, and, and it, was, it was hard to ingest. It was hard to understand, but it has come to fruition. His life, because he was the perfect son of God, he was the perfect son of man, he came and he lived a perfect life, and I saw it from the time I was born up, James is saying. And now, 
I believed it, but I couldn't believe it. But now I've seen it. The resurrection. He's come to life. My brother is the Son of God. He's the one we've been waiting for. I have seen Him resurrected. I have seen His power. I have seen His strength. I have seen His position. And He has not wavered. And this is who James is. This is how he approaches life now. Christ has come. He's ascended to heaven. And and people are going out and they're teaching and they're preaching in the name of Jesus. And they are being persecuted. And they are being, they're, they're scattering all over the, the world by this time. They're, they're leaving the diaspora, the dispersion of the Jewish Christians because of the persecution by the Jews, by the Romans. Here's James. He's under persecution. He's under the Rum, Roman rule during this time, which is stinks. The church of Jesus Christ that has formed now because of his death, burial, resurrection, and his call for us to follow him, the call to the Jewish people, the Jews are saying, what are you doing? Where did you come up with this? Yes, we saw these things. We've heard the rumors. James and others are saying, no, this is it. And this is how we have to live. James chapter 1, verses 1. Through four. James, a servant of God. And when I say servant, I mean doulos, a slave. James, a slave of God and to the Lord, Jesus Christ. To the twelve tribes in the dispersion that have left, that are running, greetings. Here it goes. Count it all joy, my brothers, When you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Here is this man, and he's probably on up in age now. Jesus would have been 34 or so, okay? James has got to be probably late 20s, early 30s, something like that. Who knows? I don't know. And he's saying, given all the circumstances that we live in, given all the circumstances of what has happened, given all the circumstances of what we've seen, what we know, what we've experienced, with the death of Stephen, with the death of other people, with the persecution that we're suffering, and people having to leave their homes and make a break for it and run, count it all joy. Count it all joy. Boy, I don't know about you, but that's a weird view. I don't know if I could be counting all that joy. And the way he ends the first verse is really kind of funny. To James, a slave, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, my brother, to the twelve tribes of the dispersion, greetings. This word here means cheerfulness, joy, overwhelming goodness to you. And they're going, well, let me get this straight. We know what happened to Jesus. We've left the country. We're the dispersion. And you're saying, you know, this is a typical greeting for them right here. Joy, peace, peace to you. Joy, greatness. And it just kind of leaves you with your mouth hanging open when he says, count it all joy, my brothers. And that my brothers is very inclusive. It says, when... Not if, when you meet trials of various kinds. Um, uh, Let me tell you what. The trials uh, that they're going through are real. We talk about trials in our life. We talk about difficulties in our lives. We look around. If you watch the news or anything, you you see what kind of trials are going on around the world. You see people in warfare. You see people in starvation. You see people in, 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 in great Political leadership positions under great duress and their, their pain is every bit as real as the people that are in warfare. Their pain, you know, when people tell me that, well, I, I know that I shouldn't complain about my health or my well-being because, you know, I know other people have it bad. Well, look, your pain is your pain. 
Your reality is your reality. Wherever God has you, that's where you are. Right? Wherever you go, there you are type thing. Well, the fact of the matter is that he's saying, count it all joy. Be, when, when you fall into trials, they're your trials. But those trials, as a Christ follower, God will go through it with you. He is not going to leave you. He's not going to forsake you. That when you go through trials and testing, and that testing is a great word right here because testing is a one I've told, I've told stories about my son Jake before when he and I went elk hunting one time and we were going up this hill and I said, the, the camper's at the top of this hill. And he goes, Dad, I can't make it. He was just a little fellow. And I said, you can make it, you can make it. We got to the top of that hill and he just kind of looked around, you know, like, dude, I mean, it's a proving ground. I knew he could make it. I knew he could make it, but he didn't know he could make it. Sometimes we go through things and God says, you can make it. We're going, I can't make it through this, God. He's going, no, you can make it. This is a trial that you're going to be going through. It's a testing. It's a proving. It's not to show me what you can do. It's to show you what you can do. And through all the adversity, all the pain, all the negativity that's going on around you, you can stand firm in knowing that I am with you and I am not forsaking you. You can be steadfast, it says. This says that, you, that for you know that the testing of your faith, and that faith is an actual, actual experiential, it doesn't mean that something, you know, something, okay, it's like us. If you, if you don't ever test your faith, if you don't ever test, it's okay to test God, okay, in, a, in, a, in effect, because we're proving God. God has given us promises in the Bible, and he's given us principles in the Bible. And he tells us, I'm good, I'm good for my word. Take, take my word for it, that, these, that I am faithful. You may not see me at work the way that you want to, but I am faithful, and I'm not going to negate myself, my will. God's will will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? And so he's saying right here, he's saying, look, the testing that you're going through, the difficulties that you're going through are going to lead you to steadfastness. Steadfastness is endurance. The ability to bear up under difficult situations. I was walking on the greenway one day, and I'm going to call out Cameron, and I saw Cameron run by, our, our great guitarist, one of our great guitarists, and dude, he never saw Pam and I. He, he, was, he was wrapped up, man. He had his music going, and he was running, and I, and I said, look at that guy. I mean, and he was, and he was not, he wasn't just jogging like I do. If, you know, I don't jog anymore because I tear myself up. But he was, he was striding. He was going. And we walked for an hour or so, and then here he comes back by again. He's still striding. I'm going, dude, that guy, he's in some kind of shape. At this time, I goes, hey, hey, hey. And he goes, oh, hey. And he stopped and he talked to us for a second. And I thought, man, you've been doing that. You didn't start today. He's got endurance. And I see people that, that, that need God in a moment of their lives. And, and they have endured many things in their lives. And God has been faithful in their lives. And they have cried out to the Lord. And they have seen His power. And they have seen His strength. And we saw it this week when, when Mike Wood passed away. And we saw the family that was praying for him. And that was, was appreciating extra time with him. And that, that the Lord let him tarry. But then the, the Lord took him away. And, and in their testing and in their trial, they saw God. They felt God. God's power. They saw his strength. And, and with life comes death, but death no longer has a sting because Jesus has taken that away. And they're going to witness that when they see Mike again. When they stand and look at him face to face, they will know that God is faithful. But they needed that history. They needed that endurance. They needed that bearing up that comes from experientially walking with God, not trying to experience God in the need. Not experiencing God at that moment when you have to have Him. And boy, I see that too. I'll be at the hospital or I'll be with somebody else and they're going through trials and tribulations and they're going, if God would just get me out of this. And I'm going, that's not the way He works. And he can. You, you know what I'm saying? Don't get me wrong. I mean, God can do whatever He wants to do. He's, well, God. So, I mean, I just kind of sit back and, and wonder at Him sometimes. At the amazing persistence and patience and endurance and in bearing up. And we are image bearers of God. And since we are image bearers of God, then we can be steadfast. We can endure. We can bear up underneath the trials that come in this world. And it's not if they come, it's what? When they come. Absolutely. And that steadfastness has its full effect. 
Not missing out on God's best. When we're steadfast, God is faithful. And he says, with that steadfastness, I am going to give you endurance. I'm going to build you up. So in those times when you need to know that I am present with you, you will affect, you will feel the full effect of the ride. Now, how many of you guys know what story I'm fixing to tell about the full effect of the ride? My wife's one of them. Miss Bishop was a te- uh, 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 an administrative aide at Southwest Baptist University where I went to school. And uh, she was an older woman. She was in her 80s. And she went on a missions trip to uh, Minnesota or somewhere like that. I don't remember. One of them Yankee countries. And so she was up there, and they were going down this uh, water slide, this big water slide. And so she goes, I want to go on that water slide. She's in her 80s. I want to go on the water slide. They go, Miss Bishop, this is a long ways up these stairs, and it's a long way down, and it goes fast. She goes, I want to go. I want to go. So she finally gets up to the top, and she's getting ready to go down. She goes, now, how do I go down? They go, just sit forward, cross your arms, go down. She goes, is that the way you go down? And they go, no, no, man. We'd lay back. Just, you know, if, if any of you have ever done a water ride, you make your You make your shoulder blades just touch, and you cross your legs so only the ball of one of your heels is touching, and you fly. You get airborne. And they told her, that's how we go down. She goes, well, that's the way I want to go down because I want the full effect of the ride. (laughs) I don't know how it turned out. I've seen her, so apparently she lived through it. But, I mean, isn't that a cool way to live? I want the full effect of the ride. When, when, we're, when you're walking with God, He's going to promise you that. He said that steadfastness that you gain, that endurance, that bearing up because of who you are and who you've seen me, how you have seen me perform consistently, faithfully to God's Word in your life, then you will know that through that steadfastness, you will get the full effect. And the full effect, it says in the last verse there, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. How many of you would be just overjoyed to be perfect and complete? I know I would. Lacking nothing. I know I would. For what? What he's talking about here is that the people that are being burdened, the people that are being persecuted, the people who are enduring the negative things of this world are overcomers through Christ. And that their, that their understanding of that and how they meet the trials of this world and how they pass the tests encouraging their strength and their, and their, and their, and their understanding of faith produces the steadfastness, the steadfastness that in the full effect will make them perfect and complete. Perfectly complete. We're talking about not as the world sees it, in great health, decent bank account, car doesn't break down, family seems to be doing good, all these things. No. When they talk about in the scripture, when it talks about perfect and complete, they're talking about moral soundness and not the morality that is coming from this world. They're talking about that moral soundness that can only come from knowing who God is. A firm footing, a firm foundation in the Christian principles that guide our lives. The Christ who defeated death is the one who has overcome in us as well. And through that, that steadfastness and that bearing up and, that, and underneath persecution and trials and testing, then our faith becomes perfect and complete. Not now, but later. This is, a, this is something that will occur. When it says perfect and complete, it means to be being perfected and pointing towards completeness in your moral understanding. Because actually, i got to be honest with you, right now, we don't understand what it means to be perfectly moral. Because we do not have God's mind. We have the mind of man that is corrupted and abused, and bruised, and calloused from all the things that we've seen in our lives, done in our lives, understand in our lives, and we have to go, we have to get to a point where we start cleansing ourselves of all unrighteousness, and that's those things that keeps us from being in right standing with God. Even as a Christ follower, we can have, we can have things in our life that keeps us separated from Him. A callous separates a loose-fitting shoe from a a wanting-to-be-intact foot, 
right? And, and, and God wants to sever us from those difficulties. He wants us to not cleave to this world. He wants to keep us in a position. And so just like good calluses, good calluses, like when you're a runner, when you're a hiker, when you're a walker, you get good calluses on your feet, right? They get strong. But you can also get calluses on your heart. You can also get calluses on your mind, in your mind's eye. Your worldview becomes perverted perverted because you've allowed certain things to enter into who you are even if you are in Christ that keep you separated from a perfect relationship from God and so we are being perfected we are being matured and we will walk that way until the day we stand before God until then we need to realize understand that we are broken vessels we need to understand that there's things that keep us from God. We need to understand that the trials and the temptations, the testing that goes on in this world is, is God does it to prove us. Satan does it to separate us. He wants to see you fail. And he will put everything that he can in front of you. So the best thing for you to do is think of all the scenarios of weakness in your life and say, God, that's a weakness in my life. I want you to give me the answer right now. And then, and then when that, that temptation attempt, attempts to break me, to separate me from you, I've seen it before, and I know what to do. I call on the name of Jesus Christ to step in the gap. And because of the blood of Jesus Christ and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ that, that tore the veil, I am no longer afraid to step into the Holy of Holies and say, God, I need you in this moment right now because you're the only one that can take this situation and be victorious. I can't be victorious on my own. I can be victorious in Jesus Christ who has saved me, who has kept me from, from the darkness of this world and separates me day in, day out and has given me a moral compass that will never change. It doesn't change with the ages. It doesn't change with the countries that you're in. A lot of countries are saying, I can't believe America has done away with abortion. I can't believe what they have done. And, and I'm just going to say, you know what? Well, I can't do that, can I? I'm just going to say, greater is he who is in me. And, and, and we're not going to fear what man can do to us. Because God has a moral law that is not wavering. It doesn't change through the days. It doesn't change through the years. It has stayed upon Jehovah. And so what we need to do is we need to understand that. And we need to petition Him in all that we do that He can make our lives straight. That when we struggle and we walk and, and we see the things of this world, that we are no longer pulled by the things of this world, but we're repelled by the things of this world. That the strength that we have comes from the Almighty God that gave us life and breath. And He says, don't worry about the person who can take your life. Worry about the person who can take your life after life. And that's who I'm worried about. That's who I'm praising. I thank God that I have my salvation through Jesus Christ my Lord. And it's nothing that I have done. It's nothing that I will have to do. It's nothing that I will have to, to bring with me and show my credentials or anything like that. I won't have to break out the book and say, look, God, I, was, I had trials. I had testing. I had evil at my doorstep. But, but I overcome. He going... Well, if you'll notice, you weren't walking. I was carrying you. Right? So we better keep things in perspective, folks. We better keep in perspective because we can lack nothing in Christ. But what happens if we lack, lack something? What, what happens? It says right here that, that you're steadfast. It'll have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Next week, we're going to talk about if you lack, because that's what it says in verse 5. So as it goes forward, it says we can be lacking. So we need to go ahead and understand right now that if you are a servant of God and you are steadfast, you are still becoming. And if you are still becoming, you can still be wavering. You can still have issues. And so what we need to do is we need to persevere, folks, right now. We need to put our eyes forward. We need to meet the trials that meets us in life, and we need to stay steadfast. And so that we can, the only way you can lack nothing right now is to put it all in whose hands? God's. Thank you. You put it in God's hands, which you feel like you're lacking and you see where you're coming up short, and you're going, God, I'm going to just double down, man, and I'm going to work harder, and I'm going to... 
God says, dude, give it to me. Put it in my hands because I can take it. I'll take that burden from you and you will feel me carrying you as on the wings of eagles because what I want for you is the greatest things. What I want for you is to be perfected in Christ. What I want you to be is a mature person walking in Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, the Son of God. And I want you to put your full faith and trust in Him. So, eyes forward, folks. I'm going to tell you right now, what was that old, uh, the weatherman back in the 60s, 70s? You don't have to be a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. I think Bob Dylan's saying, look, if you see what's happening in this country right now, we may have some small victories, and I praise God for small victories, because God's behind those small victories when they're godly. So I praise God for small victories. But boy, I'll tell you what, when you poke the dog sitting on the porch, when, when something's been the same as the way it's been for 50 years, like Roe v. Wade, when something like that's been around forever and ever, and that goes with any kind of change, don't go up there kicking the dog, right? Let, do let God kick the dog. Let dog, God poke the dog. You know, Because what's happening now is, I think that's what he's doing. I think he's telling his church, stand up. Arise, church. It's time. It's time to say what is right is right and what is wrong is wrong. And I will not be compromised because my moral compass doesn't change. I created the compass. I created due north. I created all things. And God says, you better know me and know where we're going because it's going to be a bumpy ride. So if you are a Christ follower today, I'm going to tell you right now, things aren't going to get easier they're going to get tougher. And I want you to count it all joy, my brothers. When you meet trials of various kinds, don't know what that looks like for you. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let, let, don't deny it. Don't push against it. Don't, don't, don't. Look for a comfy way to go. Let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Because if you do, and you're fully in Christ, and you're fully walking with Christ, that's where you need to be. There's people who have died. There's martyrs that have gone before you and I. There are people to this day right now that are, are, are struggling on the streets in countries that, that say, you know, in India, various other places, they are anti-Christian as they can be. I can tell you stories. Friends of ours, boy, there's countries that are anti-God, anti-Christ. We better be able to load up. We better be able to lean on the Lord. We better know experientially that your God is and your God is faithful. Because if you wait for the pure persecutions to start, if you don't have a lot of persecutions in your life, God bless you. There are people that do. All you have to do is read the news. Then you've got something to pray about. If you, don't have prayer, if you don't have needs in your life right now, open your, open your eyes, open your ears, open your mind, open your newspaper if you read one anymore. Open up the news and watch and go, oh God, where are you at work? And he's going to say what? Where there's evil at work. Where there's persecution at work. When there's trials of the devil. When there's testing of the devil. That's where I'm at work. And where does he want us? If we can't go, he wants us praying. If we can't, if we can't do something physical, and James talks a lot about that. James talks about, a lot about the physical in here. Uh, and that's okay. I believe that James was written very early. There's people that believe it was written later because they go, well, he's addressing a lot of things about like what Paul said. I'm going, no, I believe that this was written very early. James was written very early because it talks a lot about works and it talks a lot about proactivity in the world. And then, and then Paul, when he wrote his writings, it was more like, well, you know, works, yes, but, but you know, faith too. You know, faith without works is dead. And so he's, he's, he's helping make corrections. He's helping make... It all knits together to a beautiful mosaic of what God wants us to know. As we mature in faith and as we read things like this and we go, oh my goodness, persecution. And then Paul goes out and gets persecuted. And he shows us how to act in those situations. And, 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 it's, and it's a revelatory thing for us. It's, it's, a, it's a maturing thing for us. We can watch it take place in Scripture when we knit this Scripture together. That's why I'm looking forward to going through James. 
I'm looking forward to going through James because I haven't been through it in years and years, and I want to see how it knits together with the things I've been doing. I've gone through Romans recently. We've gone through Acts recently. We've gone through other things that Paul has written, and these things meld together beautifully. Why? Because God's Word melds together beautifully. And so when you read things like this, to count it all joy, you go, yes, they didn't even have cell phones back then. How can you count it all joy? You, they didn't have 401. They didn't have proper health care. They didn't even have, you know, I've been in countries where I broke out the Neosporin, what is it, tribiotic, whatever, and people looked at that and their eyes got big. And they said, when you're done with that, can I have it? I think we even have antibiotics, man. And then I see other people that their whole life is wrapped up in things that are talked about over and over in Scripture, how they will separate you from God, and they are suffering just as much, and they can't see it. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. When we, our eyes are opened up to see what's going on in this world, oh, ooh. Father, thank you so much that your grace is sufficient for the lives that we go through, that your grace is sufficient to carry us through the darkness of this world, that, Father, that we can depend on you to carry us through the trials and the testing, and that you will help us to be steadfast, that we may be complete in the day that we stand before you. In Christ alone, amen. Ah, the book of James. Woohoo! It's a, it's. I have to quote um, our son, who is. They are studying the book of James in Montana, and he said, "Mom, it's a toe stepper." And if you, if we open our hearts, we're going to have our toes stepped on, but we're going to know that God is that He reigns. And so, James, we are ready for you, and we're going to get the full effect of the ride. So if you would uh, stand and join us in Desert Song, we'll sing us out. Shall remain. I will rejoice.
don't forget, 5 o'clock this afternoon, going to the Jaipal residence, we are going to ask God's blessing on that home. And I think that that is one of the most beautiful, beautiful things that we can do as a church family. So come, uh, come and uh, uh, join us as, as we ask God, petition God to be faithful to his word that as for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. That's beautiful. All right. God bless you all. Have a great week. And uh, if I can be of any help to any of you, just give me a call. I am available. God bless you. Oh, by the way, um, Mike Wood Funeral, I believe, is going to be, they hadn't finalized yet, 2 o'clock Saturday, it's going to be here. And so uh, their church is, they asked if we could have it here because we can accommodate more folks. So at any rate, uh, be thinking about that. Watch the, uh, for a phone tree on that. So God bless you all. Have a great week. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Blessings.